Amen. Well, turn your Bibles over to 1 John 4. And we were there this, that, this past Sunday in uh, the Sunday school. And, it, and I was already thinking of the message I was going to do, but that really kind of solidified it for me. And you're, so just turn to 1 John 4. 1 John 4. In the meantime, I'll read to you 2 Timothy 4 2. You know, it's a famous verse. We all know it, but, you know, it's just, a, it's just good to always have that in the front of our minds because really that's the goal of what I'm trying to do today is, you know, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebu rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And so the, today the title of the message is Dumpster Diving Christianity. And you'll see what I mean by that. And, and it, I'm really, it, it, it's a, it comes from a, a, at least from my point, it comes from a, a point of compassion and, and sadness. But it seems like more and more today, all of Christianity is just, uh, you know, it, it, it was just a good descriptor. And actually, my wife, I credit my wife for the, uh, for the title of the message because, um, and you're there in First John. We'll we'll get to the the, the verses that I want to pull from there. But I was just talking to her, and, and you guys remember over Sunday school, and I'm going to bring up a little bit just just to bring it back in context. You know, last Friday, I decided to just post something on Facebook. I mean, I post stuff all the time. I don't post any, I mean, I don't, so, I don't do you social media. And I posted that article about Uganda trying to bring back the bill, you know, that they should kill gay people. I mean, a righteous government or just the government, whatever. That's the law of the land. All I did was post it and it, and it turned out to be a very uh, incendiary, inflammatory type of post. I didn't say anything. I didn't even uh, write anything. I just posted it. And uh, it turns out that anybody like me or any Christians that stand on the Word of God just get those kind of reactions. And what it made me think, though, I was telling my wife, I was like, how sad that society, these so-called Christians, because that's who they are, you know, and, I, and the purpose of this message is not to, I'm not uh, questioning anybody's salvation, because at one point somebody said, well, I'm saved. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, look, Solomon got off on the beaten path at the end of his life. Backsliding is a real thing. We can backslide. So I'm not questioning anybody's uh, salvation, as a matter of fact. I'm not questioning a lot of their doctrine at the time. What I am questioning is, what are the preachers at these churches doing? You know, the Bible tells us to, you know, preach the word in season and out of season. And, and, and I specifically, I'm talking about the church that these members attack me from. In Dallas, Levon Drive Baptist, you know, if you look up the history of that church in Garland, Texas, Levon Drive Baptist, it's been around since the 60s. And this church, when I went there, the pastor that was there, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't deal with the new pastor. He retired now. His name was Gary Coleman. He's just one of the, what I would consider a stalwart of the faith, you know, just, just grounded in the faith, preaching hard, the word of God. And then they passed the torch. And instead of passing the torch uh, to maintain and be steadfast and unmovable, what they've done is they've come completely moved away. You know, they've set their foundation on sand instead of on the rock of Jesus Christ. You know, and, and you look, and it's not just Timothy, but even Titus and Paul in, in the uh, pastoral epistles, he's constantly saying, I charge thee, Timothy, I charge thee, Titus. You know, and one day, whether it's here or whether I get sent out, you know, Pastor Cobb, when he ordained me, he's charging me with the duty to preach the word of God. And it's not for me to be this new uh, generation that has the newest techniques and all the technology. It's for us to stand firm on what the word of God says. And so, you know, whether, and right now, that's the, uh, that seems to be the hot topic of the day, right? The sodomy, the acceptance of the LGBTQ community, the, you know, the transgenders, the, all the sycophants that are out there, that seems to be the thing. But what really threw me off and what, what really uh, stands firm with me is, you know, just how sad, you know, you wouldn't, if, if you guys saw me down the street in a dumpster diving for food or trying to get trash out of it, I'm pretty sure maybe you guys would even stop and question my sanity. You might even stop and be like, what are you doing? Did you lose something? Is it something, something happened? And if I said, no, well, I was just hungry. And I didn't have time to make it home, so I just stopped here at this dumpster to see what I could find. You would think I was kind of maybe not in the right frame of mind. Maybe I'm not insane, but just for that moment, you might not think that. 
And, and that's the same thing that Christianity is doing today. You know, the Bible tells us to go preach into all the world, and they're standing in defense of one minority group of the entire world. And you say, well, shouldn't we preach to everybody? Well, yes, we should preach to everybody, but the Bible gives us specific instructions on how we should go about it. As a matter of fact, he says to go to the poor first. You know, he says to go to those that are uh, in the meek. He don't, we shouldn't waste as much time on the rich. We know that the rich would have a hard time going into heaven. That's just biblical, right? Uh, you know, a lot of churches spend time trying to say, well, we don't want anybody to go hungry anymore. It says the poor and the hungry will always be with us, the Bible tells us. So what we've got to do is we've got to start looking at Christianity from God's point of view. And my, the purpose of this message is to uh, basically overcome the attacks that were, at, that were, that were coming towards uh, you know, me or anybody like me. But it's not to defend. Actually, the Bible defends itself. We don't need to defend God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's to exhort and to reprove and to rebuke these leaders. You know, one of the things that I love about coming to this church, and we were just talking about that earlier, somebody told me that I needed to find a good church to plug into. And for me, a good church is one that preaches the Word of God and is willing to stand, is that Pastor Cobb is willing to stand on the Word of God. You know, and I've preached some messages that have driven people away, when he, ever since he uh, let me take uh, time behind the pulpit. But as long as it was true, he, he would stand with God's word, not with me, then instead of those congregants that left. And the same should hold true to me, right? It should be the same. And, and here's the thing that's going on is people are trying to add works to the salvation. And, and I'm not trying to undo, like I, and like I said before, this church has been around. And I'm specifically talking about this one church because the members, most of them came from there. And what saddens me is that when the torch was passed, they just, apparently they just lost the word of God. You know, and if you go to their website, I mean, what they've done for the Lord over the last, whatever, 50, 60 years has been great. You know, this, this is a soul winning, it has a huge bus ministry. At one point, it was the largest church in the Garland, Dallas area. You know, this is a great, uh, they did some great things for the Lord. But now you go on their website and the first thing is they say they stand on the word of God. But you can always tell a Baptist church that's moving away from their Baptist principles when they say they believe on the Word of God, but they don't tell you specifically the version of the Word of God that they're... Because there's only one version for the English-speaking people, that's the King James. You know, you go to a good... Uh, you know, we say we're King James only. And people are like, why? Well, because King James, uh, the King James Version is the one that, that has stood the test of time. It's God's Word. Everything else has been watered down. But I don't... But the one thing that concerns me is that these people, and I really believe that there's a lot of them that are saved. As a matter of fact, I've been through, I went to that church faithfully for years, and I've heard the messages of the gospel of salvation. Now, not from the, the, new, the new clan or the new group, but from the previous uh, generation. But here, if you go there to 1 John 4, 17, and hey, while you're there, I'm just going to read the first part. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You know, and hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And one of the things that, that really starts to stand out as you read the, 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 these epistles, uh, 1 John, I mean, uh, you know, 1 through 5 and 2 John, is that you're constantly seeing this thing about this reference to believing that the Son of God came, that He was in the flesh, that He is the Son of God, that He is who you believe on for salvation. Well, we have... God Almighty in the Word of God. The Bible says thy word is truth, right? It refers to God, Jesus Christ, as the Word. And if you go down there to verse 17, this is the, the verses I want to focus on. It says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have for him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So I wanted to tell you, this is, I, even though maybe the, the, the title might sound a little 
like I'm picking on somebody. I mean, it really is coming from a, a point of love. If these people said that, that they're saved by grace, and I'm like I said, I'm not questioning their salvation, then it's my duty to love them because the Bible commands me. But if the Bible commands me to love them, I must love them God's way. And I'm not just talking about this one. I mean, this is the church that specifically, you know, these are the members. But there's Baptist churches all over this country. You know, I hear about it day in and day out. And sometimes, you know, because I don't, I'm, we don't have uh, all the tech. We, we don't like stream our Facebook live and we don't do YouTube live. So at times, you know, we don't feel the attacks at the same uh, frequency or the same uh, consistency as other churches that preach the word of God like we do, you know, other because it's more in their face all the time. But you, so you hear it and you're like, man, it, maybe they're just not exaggerating, but maybe it's just, maybe they're just worn out. But the reality is that once you start getting them, you realize how bad it really is out there. I mean, 90% of the attacks that I got were from so-called Bible believing faith, saved by grace Christians. Now, who cares about the attacks? I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I could have done a whole sermon on, you know, think it not strange, but the Bible tells us that it's not strange. The Bible says the world, you know, that they're going to hate you because you stand on the word of God. You know, Galatians starts out with, you know, I marvel that you're so soon removed from the gospel you believed in. But the thing I want to focus on is I want to be in, uh, uh, I want to leave today, like, if anybody hears this with the thing, look, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you really want to stand on this word, then look, if you're not getting fed at your church, then go to a good church. Look, if you can't find a good church to go to, you have the word of God. It's your duty to learn what the word of God says so that you can stand on God's word because at the end of the day, that's what that's part of the, the Great Commission. It's not just baptizing them, but discipling them in the name of the, you know, in, 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 uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? So, you know, the article comes out, and, and excuse me, because I'm trying to put this all together, and I really am coming from a point where, you know, my anger is not at those people. That's why I'm not going to name any of them. I know them all by name, the people that, that attack me. I'm not going to even name them. Most of them, first of all, were women, and, and second of all, they're not in leadership. But who I am angry at is those people behind the pulpit that haven't followed the Word of God and given them the tools to know why they shouldn't be offended about certain things. You know, these same individuals will get behind, uh, you know, a Donald Trump who has said some pretty disgusting things about, some, about women. And, and I'm not, right? But when I, I mean, I didn't say anything. I just posted it, and I was, you know, apparently a bad guy. The Bible's very clear where he stands on that thing. You know, and then they start quoting all kinds of scripture. Uh, they start doing all kinds. And I'm going to address some of it, but God's word is clear where we should stand, not only on this issue, but on all issues. Look, if God says it's right and the entire world says it's wrong, we need to stand with God. As a matter of fact, he gave us a really good story in the book of Daniel, you know, and they had to stand up, I mean, uh, bow down to the image, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood because they, even though everybody else around them was not going to, you know, was uh, afraid, they weren't afraid because they were going to stand with the word of God. So, you know, I think the reason that people are so inflamed about this, and I think the reason that it's important to preach it so often, is I was telling Pastor Cobb just earlier, I said, look, the battle cry for the previous generations was uh, the fundamentals and the Word of God. But, but many of you didn't grow up seeing sodomy so openly, so blatant. I mean, you only saw it biblically. It wasn't something you experienced. I didn't grow up like that. I was 14 when I found out what homosexuality was, when my uncle sat the entire family down and told us that they were coming out. As a matter of fact, when they did it, we still didn't know what coming out meant. It was such an abstract, foreign concept. It didn't e I remember them leaving, and we went about our day. It just it didn't mean anything to us. I mean, I was 14. That's not something that you know, we just experienced. But nowadays, I mean, it's everywhere. You cannot get away from it. I mean, it's disgusting. It's, I feel like Lot at times. That's why I, don't, I try not to go out places because it vexes your spirit. Your soul is vexed, the Bible says, right? And I think the two reasons that this has happened, the two main reasons, there, there could be other, but that, that are occurring because my generation is that most people 
nowadays, even saved people have sodomites in their family. And so if the family pull is strong, if you, if you grew up like that, it's really hard to want to go against that. But the Bible says we, we ought to go to the point where we even hate our, our mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters for the cause of Christ. Now, if you read that, I'm not, I don't want to take it out of context because obviously it's when they're trying to make you join the world instead of be separate. And then the second reason, but I kept thinking about it. I was like, why was this so inflammatory? I didn't, I didn't say anything. When I did respond, I responded with the word of God. Why are Christians dumpster diving for souls? Because the Bible is very clear that full blown out. And I'm talking about those that hate God, like Romans 1 describes. Because there's a big difference. There's, it's because most people were probably abused at some point in their lives. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, I'm not confessing my sins. I'm not, when I was eight years old, my eight-year-old cousin didn't sodomize me, but he abused us, me and my brother. And I just think how sad that he would even know how to abuse us at that age. It didn't even register. That's why, I mean, I'm not, it wasn't like, it, it traumatized. It was difficult for me to overcome. But because it wasn't, it was another, one eight-year-old to another, it was just a, a moment of, where we were left alone and he knew how to do certain things that we didn't know. I mean, no 80 year old should ever know. Then, you know, it didn't, it didn't register. But as I was thinking about, it, I was like, you know, if that happened to me and that was not a, as big of a deal. So think about all the kids that have been abused in their homes by uncles and aunts and moms and dads and cousins that aren't sodomites, that aren't reprobate. But they're just so confused, and you're carrying around that guilt, and it makes sense to me. That's why I'm saying it comes from a point of love that they would see something like that, and their guilt would make them want to be defensive. Because you know, when you're guilty, what is the first thing you do? You ever catch someone that's really guilty? I didn't do it. That's a fu- bull face. I never, I never did that. I didn't break the ca- the TV or so and so. You know, whenever we were little, and my parents caught us red-handed, what is it? You start blaming somebody else. You get real flam- You know, you get mad. The reality is because you're compensating for that guilt. And what I would hope that this message leaves is that these individuals, first of all, if they feel like that, if they're in that position, that they would go to the Word of God because God can clear that up. I mean, He gives us some pretty rough examples of people overcoming stuff like that. I mean, people want to spend a lot of time in some of these, and they're great verses. But, I mean, you have verses, you know, we see uh, Judges 19, we see... You know, just right after the flood, what happened to Noah. I mean, there's a lot of examples. And if you read them in their context, it would show you how to deal with these things. You also have examples like Job that God took everything away from him. And and what did he do? He praised the Lord right away. So, I mean, there's just a lot. But I I kept thinking about this. And and so I wanted to just address it. And the, the first, I don't really have points, but I do. So the first thing I want to focus on is that we need to get back to the Word of God. And I'm specifically speaking to Baptist or saved by grace believers. This is not a message to the world. I know where the world stands on things. We need to go out and save the world or we need to separate ourselves from those that hate God. You know, there is a group, and I'm going to show you some verses in the Old Testament about God hardening the heart of people. You know, there comes a time, and the Bible speaks of blaspheming the Holy Ghost, taking the mark of the beast. You don't have a chance to get saved if you do those things. Period. You say, well, didn't God die for everybody? He died for the world, but it's still our will, our choice to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to stand up and defend the right people. You know, the Bible actually says pure religion and undefiled is, you know, for the, uh, you know, my brain uh, eludes me now, but it's for the, the, the fatherless and the widows, right? It's for, it, it, he's not going out dumpster, uh, dumpster diving. And then we look at the, the, the references and you look at someone like Paul's writings, right? Where Paul, they, they try to use a lot of scripture from Paul or Peter to overcome this. And Paul and Peter are the ones that address, I mean, along with Jude, but they seem to address in the New Testament reprobates quite a bit. So the first thing, so here we are, we're at this point. These are the arguments you're going to hear from the world. And, and the, other, the, the other goal is that as you're listening to this, these are the things you're going to hear from your family members. If, you, if this subject comes up, these are the, the attacks. This is how we overcome them. This is how we clarify things. First of all, Pastor Cobb did it in my ordination. We, we, we shouldn't engage in that. It just, 
that kind of disputing is not, it's not, it's, it's fruitless. If you're going to preach something, preach it so that it edifies, so that it teaches, so that it exhorts. You know, the reason you want to reprove someone is so that they don't go around feeling guilty all day. It's so that they know that they did something wrong and they can fix it. You know, if you're backslidden, I don't want you to stay backslidden. I want you to do something about it and get on the right path, walk that righteous path. You know, if you're not learning the Bible, then learn the Bible. If you're not going to church, go to church. But don't go around mopey and, you know, poor little me, like the plum syndrome, poor little old me, you know, ooh, you know, I, I, that's just the way I am. You know, I, I, can't, I can't stop sinning about that stuff. Maybe you can't, but God in His Spirit, when you walk in the Spirit, you can. The Bible says if we know God, we, won't, we don't commit sin. But anyways, a couple of things that I heard. These are, these are the quotes from people. I mean, I mean, honestly, it was over 100 quotes. I just took the, the, the I guess, the, the gist of it. But, you know, we are not God. Of course we're not God. Thanks for pointing that out. You know, that, was, that one's easy to overcome. But then they're like, only God can judge and kill those that sin against him. Well, you know what God did? You're right. Only God can judge and kill those. He set up governments to execute, what? The law. And the law is for what? The sinful, right? The law reminds us that we're sinners. Well, look, if you're saved by grace, you're under the blood. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. But guess what? We still live in the flesh. And I, I mean, if I murder someone, I don't care how saved I am, you guys call the cops and make sure that I go to jail. Just like if anybody. I mean, there's laws in this country for a reason. You say, well, would you lose your No, I'm saved by grace. But I'm still in the flesh. That's why I got to walk in the spirit so that you know, I'm not making stupid decisions and I'm not doing stupid things that could cause harm to not only myself, but my family. And I'm, I'm not, by the way, I'm not advocating for murder or thinking because people take things out of context all the time. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we wrestle against flesh, and, not, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, right, against the spirits. Then, you know, other things that I heard were, we're not under the Levitical law. Well... You know, if you read the Bible in its context, God, rid of the, God got rid of the ceremonial laws. As a matter of fact, that's probably the, I'm the last person you should be telling that to because as a former Seventh day Adventist, one of the ways you overcome that is you realize God improved, you know, not only did he not improve, but did he not change on the moral laws? He got tougher on the moral laws, but the ceremonial laws he got rid of. I mean, obviously, we're not sacrificing bulls and goats and sheep and anything anymore. But, you know, he said, if you look at upon another woman of lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart already. You know, it's not just the act, just even thinking about it, you've committed it. Then, uh, I'm only going to read one quote, and then we'll actually get to the scripture, because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to just know, this is out there, it's real, and, and, and you don't even have to trigger it. I mean, that's how, that's how big the target is on, on you, that once you get saved, if you decide to walk in the Spirit, and the Bible says, and yea, and all that live godly in, uh, in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, Look, if you're living godly for Christ, it's coming. And I'm not, ca I'm not calling this persecution by any means of imagination. You know, if you read the Bible, that's persecution. I, I call this maybe a little bit of a tribulation or attack. But you don't have to do it. But if you believe in God, these are the attacks you're going to get. So we might as well be ready for them. This, uh, this one lady, she put here, uh, if you truly believe that we should be executing children, she's quoting all the Old Testament. You know, they go to all the Old Testament quotes, Right? It says, and I'm going to address it here, it says, children, for that, uh, if you truly believe that we should be executing children for that, then I find that reprehensible and truly evil. It says, Jesus died for our sins. He was the fulfillment of the law. Jesus covers our sin in his death on the cross. The penalty for our sin was paid in full at that time. The only punishment is for non-believers who will be judged at the feet of Jesus. If you think that you have the right to punish non-believers or even believers for those sins, then you have put yourself in the place of God. All of that from an article. What did the Bible say? They're going to bring false testimony against us. And the reason that I read this is because where, if you go back to 1 John 4, 17, and actually, let me, 4, 20, it says, If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. These, are, these attacks were bold-faced lies. Who, and honestly, I mean, the Bible says this is, life is but a vapor. I mean, this is nothing. There's, there's countries, there's people that are preaching in Canada that are, you know, under the threat of true imprisonment. There's people that, that preach hard in, in other countries that are not only the threat of imprisonment, but even up to death. You know, there's persecution in countries like China for Christians. 
this is nothing. So I'm not, there is no poor little old son. For me, it's sad that in this day and age, in this country where we can still preach the word, there would be dumpster diving Christians that would rather go to the trash of the world and give the gospel to people who are going to hate it. I'm going to show you verses that say that, than to go out there and preach the gospel to the lost. Look, there's the lost, and then there's the, the reprobate. The people, I mean, we see that through and through, but go over to Matthew 4. Go over to Matthew 4. And then we're going to be in 1 Timothy. But Matthew 4, these just, this stood out to me because we have to stand on the word of God. Remember, what did God say? This is where he's tempted. And Matthew 4 verse 1 says, then, then was Jesus led up to the spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Look, if your table is fed, if you're fed in the spirit, you, you don't need to go to the dumpster. And what I mean by that is when people get away from preaching the word of God, they bring in all these, the, these uh, entertainment tools. They change the music and they change the dress code and they change the standards. You're not getting fed. The word of God. You're in the milk. You know, right before we started the service, we were singing the good old hymns. I told Pastor Cobb, it's like, you know, it's so sad that we've gone away from the word of God. As a matter of fact, there was an article recently, just a couple of days ago, 10 hymns that should be removed from hymnal books. Most of them because they were too gruesome talking about the blood. Well, we need to talk about the blood. Jesus died and shed it for us. Right? God himself, Jesus answered and said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then, you know, he's tempted a second time. And what does he respond? Jesus saith unto him, it is written again, thou shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Look, we shouldn't go around doing things that are against God's word, tempting him to have to do the things that he has to do. The Bible says there is a sin unto death. The Bible, you know, God is very clear that if you're his son, he's going to chastise you. Why are you tempting him to do those things? Like, you know, and then the third one, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it all, but you see the third temptation. And what does Jesus answer? He said, then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the challenge is, I think that a lot of the people are getting off the beaten path. They're trying to get the accolades of man. I mean, you think about such a small minority having such a strong voice in the Christian community. Why is that? And the reality is, they're doing it because they love the applause of these people. Because if you really go in and delve into it, even these people that say that, that you, they can be led to the Lord and that there's ministry for it, they're not spending any time doing the things that they need to do. To, you know, they're not going out there and giving the gospel to them. It's all just fluff. The reality is, the only, time, the only thing you need to do, the gospel is pretty simple, right? If you are 100% sure, if you're not 100% sure you're going to heaven today, let me show you how. You can take them through the Romans road. Look, there's a, there's a penalty. We're sinners. There's a penalty for our sin. Not only that, but the Bible has given us this gift. Jesus Christ died so that we had everlasting life. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, that's it. Anything else is just gravy. Now, if you're discipling people and doing that, but how are you going to disciple someone who's not in the Spirit? You know, I mean, a lot of the people got on the side. Uh, some of the people that were on there were former Seventh-day, I mean, not former, they're Seventh-day Adventists because I still know a lot of them. And what I found interesting was the Seventh-day Adventist is the guy who started it all. He's the one that uh, I think he, he said something along the lines of, I hope you all are joking when you love this article. He said, do you all agree that this is a good thing? And then everybody got on his bandwagon. And I thought to myself, how sad that nobody even found out the state of his soul. You know, that guy's going to hell. Look, I, you could win the battle if you want. I mean, go on Facebook and, and write all the good stuff and get all the, the likes and the loves and win that battle. I want to win the battle for your soul. And that's where I'm just flabbergasted, and I shouldn't be because the Bible says marvel not, think it not strange, but that these Bible-believing Christians, these people that are saved by grace, are not willing to walk in the Spirit and battle for the souls of men and women Day in and day out. Look, the Bible is clear in Romans 1 that if you're full out, 
And I'm going to make a distinction. If, if, if you're out, I mean, you hate God, you're vile, you love that lifestyle, you think that it's great. And like Romans 1 at the end says, you know, they take pleasure knowing their, their judgment. Those people are not worth your time. They're not worth defending. They're not worth wasting your time. Because there's a lot of people that are lost that need the gospel. You'd be surprised how receptive it is. You know, I wish we had. The Bible does say labors are few. I wish we had a huge, uh, a bigger group. And even if we had a big group, I wish we had a bigger group than that. There's so many lost. I mean, we go to these apartments here right there on Gessner and Hammerley. Man, people give us the time of day all the time. Hey, can I preach the gospel to you? Yeah. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Let me bring my kids. They want their kids to hear. Hispanics love an audience, you know, and they'll give you a whole audience. People going to heaven, just left and right. I'm not going to go waste my, I'm not going to go down to Montrose where people are just going to basically boo me out of there and waste my time. You know, go to, go to Deuteronomy, because we're going to clarify some scriptures here as to these, the, the way these, this, this movement is taking uh, uh, a hold or whatever. If you go to, in the meantime, I'll read for you, go to Deuteronomy 21, I'll read for you 1 Timothy and and for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through some scriptures quickly. But 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1 uh, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our, our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to, fall, uh, to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. And this is the verse that I was referring to when uh, Pastor Cobb or Jamie says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, Understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. See, people want to throw stones and then quote the verse. Don't throw stones, you know. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing right now for the sake of... But this is the kind of attacks that you get. The reality is, I didn't really engage. I gave one response and moved on. Because you know what? We're busy. We're busy doing the work. As a matter of fact, I loved it because that day I didn't even know. Brother James, I've told Brother James, you guys know that uh, right now he's going through some treatment. Uh, he had some surgeries for his cancer, but he's, he loves to go sewing. So I told him, I, he has an open invitation to call me whenever he wants if I'm in town. And if I have the time, I will make time to go sewing with him. Now, we, need, we have a scheduled time. But because his illness causes him to be up and down, and sometimes on our scheduled time, he won't go with us, and he wants to. So he called me on Friday, and we went soul in. That's what I'd rather be doing, not engaging on Facebook about who's right and wrong about Deuteronomy and Matthew and all this, just because some guy decided that he's going to write a bill for Uganda. Look, I don't even live in Uganda. But let me tell you what. The Bible's clear on that, and if it matches up with the Bible, they're right. I didn't say they were right on everything, but that one... Bill would be would line up with God's law. So let's just clarify a couple of things. You know, a couple of things that were throwing me was Deuteronomy 21 18 says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and mother lay hold on him, and bring him unto the elders of his of the city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones, that he die. So shall thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Look, there's a thing called capital punishment. Now, if it's not in the books here in the U.S., then don't do it. I'm not going to. As a matter of fact, it was very specific. It said, you take your child. Imagine what, what would have happened if, if uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's parents would have at least called the authorities on some of his rebellion. Right? I mean, think about it. That guy who just went and murdered and ate people for years. All those people just dead. Because nobody addressed it. Even when, even, even when he went on death row, like, it takes years now. Like, there's no swift punishment. That's why I think people aren't afraid to go to death row. They, they petition, put me on death row, because they know it's just going to take forever for anything to happen. 
So that was thrown at me. And they said, do you agree with that? That's God's word. Absolutely, I agree with it. And I know that any Bible-believing Christian would agree with it too. You say, so you would do that? Well, look, I'm going to leave my children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, but if my child is rebellious and there's laws against that rebellion, you better believe that he's going to know that there's chastisement. The Bible says, if God's going to chastise me, it says, if you spare the rod, you hate the child. Why would I hate my children? I want them to succeed in life. But the first thing I want them to do is be right with God. You know, they, they, then you get Leviticus 20, verse 9, because they, they skip, and it says, For everyone that curseth his father or mother shall, sh- shall sh- be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father, father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulterer shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Are you saying that I'm advocating for, I'm advocating for a government that has a death penalty? And if it lines up with God's word, then it lines up with God's word. Look, for many years in this country and all over the world, sodomy was illegal. I mean, even in this country, I looked it up right before we started. Adultery is still illegal in like 21 states in this country. If you cheat on your wife, there's states in this country that you can go to jail for cheating on your wife. So, I mean, but if I, if you say, if, you know what, if I preached, the message from man's law, if I got the Constitution, people would be like, gun ho, that's right, throw them in jail, go to war. But you get up and preach God's word, oh man, you're a bigot, you, you hate people, you're so evil, how can you say you got God's love, you're the worst. I mean, literally, it's the same laws, but if you preach them from God's word, it's bad. Because at some point in history, these were the laws. It's not like, I mean, I, I'm not just being exaggerated. Go to 2 Peter 3, I'm going to Matthew 5, verse 27. I just wanted to make that point. The Bible doesn't change. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said uh, by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust, after her hath committed adultery with her in her heart, already in his heart. So it's not like God's changed. Jesus is going through the same thing. As a matter of fact, nobody quoted the Old Testament. I mean, one of the individuals, I don't know of nobody, I, I shouldn't say that because I'm not 100% sure, but he quoted the Old Testament a lot. And I would venture to say he might have quoted the most in the New Testament. Second Peter 3, verse 5 says, for, uh, for this they willingly are ignorant of, of, I'm sorry, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against, uh, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning this promise, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering to, to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look, this was thrown at me, 2 Peter 3, 9. I'm, I agree 100%. But we got to read it in context. He says he's reserved it. He's not going to flood the world again. Why? It's reserved for fire. There's a judgment coming. And he's reminding us, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. So we can get out, get off our hind butt, stop watching you know, and I, I didn't mean to use the word bud, but it came out. So I'm sorry. I apologize. I really was going to say your hind quarters. And it's, but get off that sofa, get off the things, and go out there and do the work of the Lord. He is not slack concerning his promise. That's why, you know, he's given us this time. Because the mark of the beast is not yet here. The false prophet is not yet here. The, the, uh, the Antichrist is not yet here. So we have time. And even during that time, we'll have time. But everybody just wants to make excuses and just be men pleasers. You know, go over, uh, go to Exodus, and I'll just read 2 Peter uh, 14. We'll continue at the end. Go to Exodus 7. Go to Exodus 7, 
But 2 Peter 3, verse 14 says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom giveth him, given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which were some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also other scriptures, what? Unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest also, lest ye also, being led away with the air of wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Fall from your own... You know, these churches have fallen from their own steadfastness. They were on the straight and narrow, and they passed the torch, and where they failed is that when they gave that, they didn't give them the foundation. The last verse says, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Savior Christ, to Him be glory now and forever. Amen. Look, I'm not preaching anything new, and I'm not, I am touching the subject of the reprobate a little, because that's what people are so mad about. But if you go to Exodus 7, verse 1, I mean, this is from the very beginning. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my, son, my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Look, God hasn't changed. Jesus hasn't changed. Who's hardening Pharaoh's heart? Who's making Pharaoh reprobate? God. Why? Because Pharaoh hated God. As a matter of fact, we, if you go through the whole Exodus, there's mockery. I mean, he changes. He keeps toying with the people of Israel. Every plague only makes him kind of, you know, uh, what is it? Anchor in even more against God. Verse 9 says, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord said. I mean, I'm not making stuff. I'm not preaching anything that's out of the Bible. And look, if I am, please correct me. And if you don't have the guts to correct me, then listen to God. Now, I know, you know, I, the age group that is our church, you know, the older generation, they're real good about correcting the younger generation. So I'm not worried about that. So if you guys find anything wrong with me, I am pretty sure I will hear about it at some point in the next, in the near future. So I'm not worried about that. But look, there's an article. Just for the sake of time, we're going to start closing this out. We're almost done. This, this just came out on October 14th. What's the day? The 16th? So two days ago. It starts out with, this is the, the headline. It's an assembly line. Detransitioned man says parents encouraging kids to become transgender are guilty of child abuse. This is someone who went through the process for eight years. And he explains why. And this is why I started with that. And then he says, look, this is child abuse. And he's getting all kinds of attacks. This is not a Christian person from what I can read in the article. This is not someone that, that is saved by grace or that goes to church. This guy's in England somewhere or in Europe. It says, a man who lived for eight years as a trans woman before detransitioning has called out the child abuse from adults who encourage transgenderism in kids, saying it is abhorrent, it interferes with the natural development. He was born male. Walt Heyer began transitioning to female at 42 years old. He lived that way for eight years before realizing he had been a victim of a childhood abuse. This is what I was talking about. And the process of returning to his birth assigned gender. And so then he talks about the, the, the interview, and he talks about how at age four, his grandma would encourage him to wear a purple dress, and how he suffered sexual abuse at the hands of an uncle as a direct result. So he's talking, and this is, you know what the age of this individual is now? 74. He clears that up. He says, the consequences of grandma affirming me became very destructive. I think it's actually evil, and it's child abuse to indicate that you can change a gender at such a young age. I'm speaking from 74 years of experience. So this is not, you know, these like young millennials who have gotten on the bandwagon. They don't know anything. They're just basically regurgitating what the world's telling them. This is a 74 year old individual who says, look, I've lived life and I'm telling you, this is child abuse. Now we didn't need a 74 year old to verify that because the Bible says that. 
God's word hasn't changed. God's word says that that's wrong. It says, look, it's so bad, tie a millstone around their neck and toss them in the sea for that child abuse. They're brute beasts. They're filthy, they're wicked, they're vile, they're disgusting. In case all those people didn't know where I stand, because I'm not going to get on a Facebook argument, but I will get behind the pulpit and tell you, I stand on the word of God. You don't like it? Tough cookies. I don't know what to tell you. Like, and then later on, I'm not going to read the whole thing. At the last part, he says, don't let them tell you that they, get, uh, that they go through, my, through some exhaustive psychological counseling. This guy went through it like eight years, so he knows the experience. He says, because it's absolutely baloney. They just approve, 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 affirm, 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 give them hormones, give them surgery. It's an assembly line. Think about the child abuse on a child. As young as three years old, they're starting to say, hey, look, if you think you're... Your name's Johnny, but you want to be little Janie. Go for it. It's disgusting. All of this could be avoided if the land of the law, if the law of the land, sorry about that, if the law of the land was the death penalty. Look, this country still has the death penalty. It's not specifically for that, but there is the death penalty. So it's not like I'm being exaggerated in my request. That actually exists. And as a matter of fact, political parties, both sides, advocate for what? The death penalty. Oh, death onto this. And de this, is, this is pretty grotesque. I would think this is along the lines of a serial killer or someone like that. For someone to tell a young child that that's okay. And, you know, I'm not, I just read that. There's no need to go into it. It's disgusting. The Bible is very clear about that. So what, you know, so what do we do with this? Why even preach something like this? I mean, it's really more of, like I said, I don't have points, but I have points. Because my, 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 my plea, just like the people that, that exhorted and reproved and rebuked me, look, I didn't, I've always agreed with this. Once I got saved, I didn't ever disagree with the word of God. Even when it was foreign to me, if God said it, I knew it was true. I, but I wasn't as vociferous. I wasn't as strong as I was about it now. And my prayer is that, in the next years, I get even stronger about it so that I can face the challenges that come ahead. But my, my prayer is that these people would listen and that they would get in the Word of God and that someone like me or someone, if it's not me, somebody else would prick at them and get them on that righteous path, on that walking in the Spirit. Look, I got saved when I was 25. It's almost 15, 25, 34, yeah, almost 15 years. When I was 25, I was saying stuff like, look, Whatever they do in their bedroom, as long as they don't do it in my bedroom, it's okay. Let them live their lives and let me live my life. But then you read the Bible, and you're like, well, I, I can't think like that. So then a couple years later, it's like, well, it's really, it's, it's a sin and it's bad. And you keep reading, they're worthy of death. You know, oh, well, that's what God says, that's what God says. I mean, that's my prayer. My sadness is that these preachers aren't getting behind the pulpit and they're training their congregations and they're discipling them and I don't know what. It's not God's word. 70% of Americans say they're Christians and yet the Sodomites seem to be ruling the country. I mean, just, I didn't even know. I thought it was a joke. I actually thought it was a joke. I really did. I saw something that said that the Democrats had a LGBTQ town hall and you know, there's this thing called, I don't know if you know, but for our generation, there's this thing called the Babylon Bee. Have you ever heard of that? It's BabylonBee.com, and what they do is they just make fun of, like, uh, you know, uh, different things. Like, the latest article, just to give you an idea of how, what they do is they poke fun. They're like, your, your doorbell ringer, you know the ones that have the cameras? It says, now doorbell ringers are programmed where they'll, where they'll argue with the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses on your behalf. So, you know, stuff like that. So you read it, and they make it sound like, so I thought it was a joke. Why, you know, you click on it, it, it was real. There was a town hall, I don't know where with a bunch of Democrats talking to just LGBTQ community like it was nothing. In 1994, when my uncles came out, that would have been unheard of. Why? Because we're not preaching the Word of God. Because nobody's behind it. Like, let's go to, and then let's close out with this. I got three more verses and we're done. Go to Titus, because that's where I'll close. But in Matthew 7, verse 1, it says, Judge not. That ye be not judged. That's the one people love to tell you, right? And when they don't, then they stop there. It says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you. And why beholdest thou the mote in 
that is in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how will I say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of thine eye, uh, out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou clearly to, and then, uh, and then shall thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. And then verse 6 says, Give not that which is holy unto dogs. And we know what the Bible references as dogs. It's the sodomite. It's the reprobate. It says, Neither cast ye your per, per, uh, pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend. You know what's going to happen to these individuals that are advocating and trying to get the approval of this group? They're going to turn around and they're going to attack. They're never satisfied, the Bible tells us in Romans 1. They're implacable. They're insatiable. They don't want to do it because I never, I've never heard a sodomite say, well, I just want to be accepted because I'm looking for salvation. Now, when I go soul winning, I've actually heard that sometimes. When I'm preaching to people, people say, well, how do I get saved? What do I have to do you know, to have eternal life? But I've never heard it. The Bible is very clear. They go and, and quote verse 1. But they totally miss verse 6 where God, this is Jesus Christ saying, what? Don't give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Lest they trample them under their feet and turn against you. You know, Proverbs 9, 7, you're in Titus, we're almost done. He that reproveth the scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh the wicked man getteth himself a blot. I'm not rebuking or reproving the world. I'm talking to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Look, if these people really say they're saved, this message should ring true to them. This me As a matter of fact, I've had beliefs that I thought were biblical, and somebody cleared them up with the Bible, and guess what? The Bible wins. That's just, I mean, that really is the bottom line. That's, that's what it comes down to. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7, 5, and I'll just read that one. It says, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the songs of fools. People, people will then want to take stuff out of context. And I just want to make the final point because I remembered it. I, I had it, a, you know, where people will want, and then they'll start going through these scriptures, and they'll start saying, well, we need to go back to, and they want to go back to the Hebrews or the Greeks or whatever. And I remember Pastor Cobb telling me this just a couple months ago. He goes, I studied Hebrew and Greek in, in, in seminary. He goes, but when, when it all came down to it, it's, it's not necessary. We have the Word of God. Look, let's first preach this and get a hold of this and understand this. And then, if you really want to, hey, I'm not against you learning another language, but not so that you can disprove the Word of God, but that you can just confirm that the Word of God is the Word of God. It doesn't matter. I've read it in Spanish. It's the Word of God. I'm learning Greek just for fun. I haven't, you know, but it, I don't, it doesn't matter. God's Word is God's Word. I know that if I read it in Greek or I read it in English or I read it in Spanish, it's going to say the same thing. I'm not trying to disprove it, right? But go there to Titus and let's close out with this. The Bible says in, in verse 5 of Titus 1, it says, this is another charge. It says, for this cause left thee I in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. And ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not a striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. There is a moment to convince, but it's from the office. It's from the preaching, not on Facebook or YouTube or whatever other social media or one-on-one -on -one when people are watching so you can get the attention. It's behind the Word of God. And if there's no pulpit, then it's just the Word of God. The Bible says, let's, let's close. Uh, um, verse 10 says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. You know what we can liken that to today? Those that, that want to focus more on the law and the works than the faith and the belief. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of them themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, 
evil beast, slow bellies. Look, if you were to talk to them, this is the equivalent of if I went out and, and a sodomite got to me heart to heart, he'd say, look, they're always liars, they're evil beasts, and they're slow bellies. They will admit to themselves. It says, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, unto every good work, reprobate. And you know, all it makes me think is, I am not making a case. I have a whole sermon called the Reprobate Doctrine. I'm not making a case. I believe in it. From, and I'm talking about the Romans 1 where there, it's just, there's a hatred. There's a big difference by people who have been abused and that causes confusion. Imagine at a young age being abused. That'd be a difficult thing to overcome. I'm talking about these people that hate it. What really stands out to me is, look, if you believe the word of God, Romans 1, I'll close, it says there in the last verse, it says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they not, it says, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. How can you go and think that you're going to give the gospel to someone who has pleasure knowing that the judgment's coming? That's why the title is Dumpster Diving Christianity. You're in the dumpster. And if a false prophet is teaching that, you're in the dumpster. Now, if your church believes the gospel correctly, but they're just not giving you that meat, it's time to start looking for the meat. We... There comes a time where, and it's coming much quicker. I'm actually impressed at how fast it's coming. I was talking to Pastor Cobb, like, it's just everywhere. These messages need to ring true more and more because it's, it's coming so quick. It's invading Baptist churches everywhere. And I didn't even have time for the sake of time where they're getting this type of stuff from. Just look up a church in Las Vegas. They call themselves, you know, you've heard me talk about the new independent fundamental Baptists that are trying to keep the old ways. There's another group called Fundamental, the new independent Baptist. I think they got rid of the F. And what they're saying is they're new independent Baptists, but what they're doing is they're preaching, welcome them in. God would have loved the Sodomites. God would have done this. Look, once you start letting a little filth in, it, it doesn't take... If the dam breaks, I remember my, uh, my, my father-in-law, when the flooding was happening, uh, you know, we thought, that, remember that we thought it was going to break, it was going to overflow. And he said, well, and he's an engineer, he works for the water district up in North Dallas, and he said, you don't want it to overflow. So then he took me to some dam that overflowed like 30 years ago. He said, go look up this video. I mean, once you let a little trickle, it just starts to seep over. Once it seeps over, it breaks. Once it breaks... There is no containment. You know, I, I'm not playing the political game. I know, I don't know if you like the mayor or not, but the one thing that we know for a fact is it was better to let out that water than to let that, that thing break, right? It was better. The reality is in our lives, our spiritual lives, and that's a bad, but in our lives, we shouldn't even let the water out. We should just let God's word separate us completely from that. But the minute we start letting that trickle in, it breaks it, it's over. We might as well just call it a day. Sorry I went so long, but let's go ahead and close in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thanks so much for today and, and the opportunity to preach. And Lord, I probably will never preach another message in the context of somebody calling me out on Facebook or anything like that. But I think it's important that if there are Bible-believing Christians out there, that they get in the word and they walk in the spirit, Lord, and that they prepare for the battles ahead. You know, but the Bible... Uh, one of the, the hymns that came out of this idiot who said we should get rid of hymns was Onward Christian Soldiers. I believe that, that hymn is great because you tell us constantly to war a good warfare, that we wrestle not against blood and uh, against flesh and blood. So, Lord, let us not go out into the dumpsters of society. And what I mean by that, the spiritual dumpsters, those dumpsters where people are vile and wicked without natural affection, uh, burning in lust one after another, leaving the natural use of the woman or the man. I'm talking about let us go into the, the spiritually receptive areas. They may be poor. They may be not the nicest neighborhoods, but if people want to listen, help us to go out there and proselyze and preach the word in season and out of season. And, 
and that we may be an encouragement and a leadership to those that are uh, that maybe have the faith but just don't understand the word of God completely so they can get out there and fight the same battles with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.